Hello, this is Lisa Elwin. Welcome back to our series on the seven abominations of the wicked lamp. We have now worked our way all the way to the sixth seal of Revelation. And in our last program, we came to a really interesting uh, idea in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, as it pertains to the gathering of the four winds and the gathering of the 12 tribes of Israel from the four winds. And so we read out of Isaiah 11 in, in the last program, it says, he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel, and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So those might uh, appear to be equivalent expressions here, and I think they are, but in an equivalent expression, there will still be a slight difference between the two things being compared. And where it says he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel. I believe it's, it's in the, the verse just before where he describes where the remnant of his people will be located at that time of the end gathering. And in that list of nations where the remnant will be located, it begins with Assyria. And of course, Assyria um, is credited, I don't know if they want the credit, but they are credited with uh, dispersing the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Um, they sent them out into exile. They mixed among the nations and, and pretty much, uh, we know where a few of them are, but the rest, they have been lost in history. And like, lots of people like trying to trace their ancestry back to the 10 lost tribes. Um, but, you know, even Jews say that when King Messiah returns, even Jews don't really know their ancestry at this point. There's been too much bad history in between uh, that it's going to be Elijah's job to sort everybody out. And you'll know what family you're from and what tribe you're from and so forth. But the idea here is that this standard lifted up for the nations, of course, is Yeshua. And it says he will assemble the banished ones of Israel. In traditional uh, Jewish thought, King Messiah is the one who will uh, gather the lost exiles of Israel. By mentioning Assyria, it, it kind of points us up to those northern tribes. And then it says, and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So Judah also having been dispersed, for the most part, they've kept their identity as a people group, um, but he's put these two things together. The, the brothers were split apart under Jeroboam, and he's saying, I'm going to call both of these brothers back. I'm going to uh, call Ephraim and Judah back. He says, the jealousy of Ephraim will depart, and those who harass Judah will be cut off. Um, Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, and Judah will not harass Ephraim. And then they're going to swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west. Of course, Ephraim camped on the west. He's going to come in from the west. Um, they're going to plunder the sons of the east where Judah was encamped, possess Edom and Moab. Edom, of course, is the south where the, the division of Reuben. Um, and so he, he's got here regathered the the nation of Israel. And it says, he will wave his hand over the river with his scorching wind, and he will strike it into seven streams and make men walk over dry shod. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left, just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. So there's a similarity here. He's saying it's not gonna be identical. When you see prophecy repeated in history, it's never identical but you get the earmarks. You, you get, um, you know, uh, kind of these, these beacons, beacon lights that will, draw, that will pull you in and, and let you know that you're on the right track for a good landing in that case. But here, by again mentioning a highway for Assyria, there's the idea that there will be exiles from the northern tribes that will be called back. They will be among this remnant. So he creates a highway for them to come home. And then he compares it to when the Israelites came out of Egypt. Well, if you remember, Pharaoh let the people go 
everything's good. Here's all this golden stuff. You know, take all our goods. You may go now. And then Pharaoh changes his mind. He hardens his heart and he starts chasing after them with all his military force. And so they walk through the Reed Sea dry shod, but then the sea closes back over Pharaoh's army. So this return of the nations from Assyria, whatever nations they've been exiled to, um, it, it sounds as though it's a replay. It might look a little bit different because now they're coming from everywhere. They're coming from the direction of the four winds instead of just one direction. But again, he says it, it was uh, the, the great river, which is the Euphrates, it was dried up into seven streams. So if they're coming from the four winds, and then he makes these seven streams, it's going to make a whole lot of sense. The four winds, but into the seven streams. Of course, the seven streams are really four streams. Because remember, in the Garden of Eden, you have this outer river, which is the Pishon. You have this next river right here. Uh, you have the Gihon. You have the Chidakel, and then the Parat, it's this, this great Euphrates River. And it was said to have flowed from beneath the throne down into the Garden of Eden. So these rivers right here, even though they're, they're only four rivers, when you look at the description, of course, they go in, in concentric circles. They travel around basically the Tree of Life in the midst of the Garden. And so... Israel is going to be called home. And if you know what is hovering just above the physical land of Israel, you know it's the Garden of Eden is hovering just above the physical land of Israel. This is why Abraham needed to arise and walk the land. Why does he need to arise if he's already in the land? Because Abraham needed to see what was up a level. He needed to see the land that his descendants would inherit and its resurrection. That's why when the righteous are gathered in by the angels at death, they are gathered into what's called Abraham's bosom because they are taken into what Abraham saw was promised to him and his descendants. Just like Yeshua said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. Abraham saw the resurrection because he arose and he walked. And in fact, um, that's what it says of this inner river. It says that it, it walked. It sounds as though Abraham was able to arise and actually walk into this inner place of the garden that we would see hovering just above the physical land of Israel. And so a way is going to be made for Israel to return and cross over these rivers. And remember, as you're looking at these rivers, the Parat or the Euphrates actually came from the throne itself. So you can see if, if he dries up uh, the Euphrates River so that they can cross uh, with those seven streams, but nevertheless they're dry shod, you can see why it would be impossible for the kings of the east to pursue them into this place. If you're wicked, if Adam and Eve couldn't stay in there, well, the wicked aren't going to be able to cross into there. That's ridiculous. It would destroy them. And so the way is made for Israel to come back into the garden. And it's the difference between being able to see the garden. You, when, when you go to the land of Israel, you don't go there to see the physical rocks and sand or trees. That's not what you're going to see. You are going to see what you cannot see, which is the Garden of Eden that's hovering just above it. And what is there hovering just above it? It says, when we get to the place where we cherish her stones, that's when Messiah is going to return. So yes, you do. You go and you see the physical rock. You go and you see the physical sand and the trees. But because you cherish even those natural rocks and trees, he says, your heart is prepared for Messiah. And now I'm going to let you see what Abraham saw when I told him to lech lecha. Well, that's what this river does. It says it holech. It walks. It walks around the garden. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to arise and walk around the garden. 
And so as it looks to these kings who are pursuing and then these military forces that are pursuing them, remember they're engaging on a very natural level. They're gonna come to a river and think it's okay to cross it because didn't these people just go across it before us? Well, they did not perceive exactly how and where those people crossed because if they could see it, they would never put foot in it because that's gonna be their destruction. So this, this highway from Assyria, this highway from the nations, um, we've got all kinds of contexts right there to help us understand um, how Yeshua being this standard for the peoples, he is this way of resurrection that's going to allow the peoples um, who are bound to their covenant, who are bound to their Messiah, to be able to cross back in here. Uh, and remember, too, among... Um, the, the, the verse that we read in Isaiah, it broke it into two groups. It said the, the remnant from Assyria, but then also of Judah and how Ephraim, which can also symbolize the northern tribes, and Judah, they will no longer be jealous. They'll no longer trouble one another. There will no longer be enmity between these two brothers. They will be united. And so um, the, the number of the northern tribes that was taken into Judah, kind of absorbed by Judah. At one point in history, uh, Jeroboam uh, set up the two altars. He set up one in Bethel. He set up one in Dan. He changed the times of the feast by about a month. And so he would encourage the northern tribes to come worship here where it's more convenient. Don't trouble yourself walking all the way down um, or up to Jerusalem, and it is up, no matter which direction you come from. Just make it easy on yourself. Stay here and worship. And so eventually those roadways were opened back up by a particular king of Judah. And so the Israelites in the north, who had kind of been closed up there, unable to go and to observe the feasts in Jerusalem, a lot of those did move into Judah, and they were just kind of absorbed uh, by Judah to the point that when we get to the, the book of Esther, they're all called Jews, even though they still understand maybe I'm from the tribe of Benjamin or maybe I'm from the tribe of Asher. Uh, so you would say that it's probably the, the best representatives of the northern tribes who ended up attached to Judah. But the promise here is even though those who were exiled because of idolatry, a path will be made. And Yeshua will be the standard uh, that attracts all of the, all these brothers to come back. Um, and in Revelation 9, 14, it says, uh, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. All right, so we've talked about the angels of the four winds being held back uh, until the, the bond servants of Adonai are sealed in their foreheads. And so um, there's perhaps four different angels, it says, who are bound at the great Euphrates, but perhaps they are the same four angels. We're not told specifically, but if they are the same four angels in charge of the four winds, we have to, to not look at the great U river Euphrates in the natural realm and say, now wait a minute, if these are messengers of Adonai sent to effect destruction through the four winds, then their being bound at the great river Euphrates is probably not uh, bound at this physical river Euphrates. It's more likely they are, they are bound or prevented from doing this destruction because, uh, remember, the Euphrates or the Parat River of Eden was said to have come from beneath the throne of the upper garden. And it flowed down into the lower garden or what we would call the Garden of Eden or the third heaven. And so if they're, they're bound there, they're bound at a much higher level than we would think they are, which makes better sense um, in the sense that they are in charge of the four winds, which are seen as hovering above the earth, maybe not, you know, so much below. 
Just something to consider. And then Revelation 16, 12, it says the sixth angel uh, poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings of the east. Um, so what's happening here? Obviously, these kings are going to their destruction. If, if we understand Isaiah, that's what he's telling us. The Euphrates will be dried up um, into seven streams. And these kings of the east, and remember the, the hot destructive wind comes from the east. It's, it's also the, the direction the camp of Judah faced. They will think that they can follow Israel, which it, at one point, uh, King David did actually uh, wage war all the way as far as the Euphrates River. And it seems as if in the millennial kingdom that the boundaries of Israel will be extended that far. Um, at any rate, these kings of the east are going to believe that they can chase Israel over this river, but they cannot. They cannot enter into that realm simply because of what it is. Um, so why, why does it seem to be associated with the, the sixth angel, uh, the sixth seal? Well, if you'll remember your lessons from workbook one, the sixth spirit of Adonai, right here is the spirit of knowledge. And remember the spirit of knowledge, it's, it's not really information. You get the information with wisdom and understanding. Um, when you get over here to the spirit of knowledge, these things are already established. And now it's become you. You're a, you're a whole person. It's uh, also a day of sacrificial love when we look at the sixth day of creation where one became two, Adam became two, he became Adam and Eve, and then he became one again. He knows his wife. So when you know something in the biblical sense, there is a unity that's suggested by knowledge. So once we get over here to the sixth, it may look like there's great destructions upon the earth at this point, and there Obviously there are, but for the righteous who are walking in the spirit of Adonai, they have attained at this point a spirit of knowledge, which is a sacrificial love and unity. Um, I don't know at this point, I would characterize the people of faith as uh, behaving towards one another with sacrificial love and unity. Uh, um, I don't wanna give a bad report. Um, so I'm gonna add yet. <laughs> We're just going to assume that everybody's in the group and we have just not yet achieved that level of sacrificial love and unity that's suggested by the sixth seal, um, the sixth trumpet, the sixth bowl, the sixth spirit of knowledge. Um, but I think the idea here is even as we see the wicked nations being destroyed and broken in two, they may have had a unity before, this unity of wickedness is going to be broken, whereas it's the people of faith in Yeshua, people who still believe that, that Adonai is the king of all kings, they will come into a sacrificial love and unity. And when a, a love is sacrificial, it costs you something. In Adam's case, it, it cost him flesh and bone. And so as, as we come together, as we begin to band together as people of faith, we will probably have to set aside some things uh, that were near and dear to us. We, we might have you know, certain little pet doctrines that we've loved and petted on for years. Um, and it may be that we find out that that doctrine is exactly what's separating us from brothers. And we might feel this transition in our hearts where we say, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to lay this down and love my brother with sacrificial love. Uh, because often it's not a matter of holding to the truth. It's just a matter of holding on to the truth you know. I see that very often. People believe they're holding on to the truth. Instead, they're holding on to the truth they know. But if they would give themselves permission to continue and to grow and to learn and to transform through the Holy Spirit five years from now, that may not be the truth they know. Um, at any rate, that's a wonderful transformation here that takes place because Israel is being rescued. 
Israel is being gathered. Israel is being brought into unity with their brothers and sisters. And so with that sixth judgment, we're being reminded of the very proclamation of our faith. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Yisrael, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so with this gathering, preparing here for the destruction of the seventh abomination, uh, and remember, the sixth abomination is a false witness who breathes out lies. This is somebody who can't tell the truth anymore. Or maybe they can only tell the truth as they know it. It's the truth they know, but it may not be the truth. According to it is written, it might be a, a twisting application of the truth. And so what they're speaking, and, and be careful of this too. This is just a, a caution I can give you. Take it from an old lady, okay? There are, are things that we learn. And because we understand sometimes our knowledge is so deficient, our wisdom and our understanding is so deficient, especially if we have come lately to the, the knowledge of the Torah, we, we can feel very inadequate. We feel like, well, I'll just never learn everything I need to learn to feel competent. Well, you don't need to feel competent. You need to feel competent and bold in what Yeshua knows. And trying to make up that, that feeling of, you know, I, I just don't feel competent and, and I very much want people to think I'm competent and that I know a lot and, and I want to feel righteous. Don't worry about how you feel because what you'll tend to do is you'll reach out and you'll educate yourself maybe on one aspect of your walk. One aspect. You, you will research and research and research and research. You will be like, I don't want to talk, call you a dog, but like a dog on a bone. There is one topic that it just seems like no matter what the topic of conversation is, you will work that topic in there, even if it doesn't belong. And these little pet doctrines, they are quite a distraction because often what they will do is they will tend to create separation between you and your brothers. And in order to convince yourself that you're doing the right thing here, when there's something inside you telling you maybe you're not, you will say, well, this is truth. And, and because I hold the truth and they don't, then this explains the separation that's occurring. Rethink that. Rethink that. Is that the truth or is that the truth you know today? Um, the sixth seal has gone to judge this sort of stuff. And so if the sixth abomination is a false witness breathing out lies. In other words, you have become that pet doctrine. And it, because you feel competent talking about it. But there's so many other aspects of our walk that you won't deal with because they don't make you feel competent. That, you know, the spirit can go right to the heart of such things. Right to the heart of it. And so, if he's going to destroy the seventh abomination, which is one who separates brothers, you can see why it's such a focal point of the sixth seal. He's, he's trying to gather the faithful together in unity. And if you're breathing out lies, if you're, if you're witnessing falsely, then all you can do is spread disunity among brothers. And you, you might even be one who maintains them in disunity. You know, they might already be in you, disunity and you make sure they stay that way. He's going to cast those things down. He's going to destroy anything that is preventing brothers from binding together in the unity of the faith. So, these four angels at the four corners of the earth, they're, they're pointing to us of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And again, the Ruach Adonai, the Spirit of Adonai, is represented here by the fourth in Numbers. We're looking at as Isaiah's seven spirits of Adonai. 
you know, spirit of understanding, uh, excuse me, spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge, reverence. What's here in the middle? That's the axis of, axis of it. It's the spirit of the Lord. And so the four angels, they are going to be moving in congruence with the Holy Spirit. And they're going to be protecting the righteous men and women. Um, they're going to be protecting even the parts of creation that need to be preserved until the righteous are sealed. And that means that um, at, the, at the point where we're seeing these storm clouds of destruction gathering over the earth, at the very same time, the righteous are going to be revealed. Adonai is going to reveal the righteous. They are going to be hidden from the wrath. Doesn't mean they're going to be hidden from tribulation. It means they're going to be hidden from the wrath. They are going to be protected under these coverings of spiritual authority through the power of his spirit. So if you'll notice, you've got wisdom here. You've got reverence here. Remember, one of the, the goals in Revelation was to bring people to a reverence of Adonai. Uh, and that's what happens. When the first branch touches the seventh branch, say when the white horse rides out here, wisdom is going to touch reverence. The second branch, you're going to have the second branch touch the sixth branch. So the red horse, he's going to be touching understanding and knowledge. It's one thing to understand. It's another thing entirely to sacrifice your life for what you understand. This third branch, it touches the fifth branch. So we have the black horse here. It's, it's connecting the spirits of counsel and power. And these are two resurrection spirits, by the way. Um, and then we come to the pale horse. And of course, that's going to be uh, what brings death. And it folds itself on its axis right here, um, but what you have covering you are these seven spirits of Adonai, and they are the antidote to any destructive power that might be given to those four horsemen to judge the families of the earth, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm hoping that's providing you um, a little bit of comfort, because in that sixth seal, you've got things beginning to fall under covers of protection. If you remember the, the coverings of the sixth day that you studied in workbook one, the, the coverings, remember you've got the wings of the fifth day, even extending into the sixth day. And so you've got an angel who is going to come. Now that we're talking about the sixth seal, we have an angel who is going to come with a seal or a Chetam in Hebrew, Chetam. And we know the living God, uh, he comes from the rising of the sun. He comes from the east. Um, and again, he's coming from the direction of the Lion of Judah, from the tribe of Judah. So the tribe of Judah, it looks like, will be sealed first, right? But he was the fourth son of Israel, the four, number four representing authority. And he led that wilderness camp from the east. Once the pillar of cloud and the ark moved, it was Judah's responsibility to, to discern that and to move first. And if you think about it through history, the greatest number of martyrs who have been slain for the sake of the word, they've come from the tribe of Judah. They have shown us what sacrificial love for their for their covenant means. They have shown us in the Inquisition and the pogroms. They have shown us that uh, to understand something is more than just head knowledge. If you're going to understand something, then you're going to have to sacrifice for it eventually. <laughs>